A major obstacle to obtaining useful energy from a nuclear fusion reactor is containment of the fuel at the very high temperatures required for fusion. All right, so this is uh, discrete. See that? All right, so these are some discrete questions. Um, this is discrete question number 26. Um, it says, a major obstacle to obtaining useful energy from a nuclear fusion reactor is containment of the fuel at the very high temperatures required for fusion. The reason such high temperatures are required is to blank. All right, A says, eliminate the strong nuclear force. Um, actually, before we move on to the answer choices, let's go over some fundamentals here. Um, you don't know, you know, you don't know, need to know exactly what a nuclear fusion reactor does or how exactly it works. There's one thing you do need to know, and that is, let me see if I can get the, the pen, I guess, there you go. Um, that is, what is nuclear fusion? And nuclear fusion is when you get two nuclei, and you're going to press, you know, smush them together, okay? And this is obviously a very rough drawing. You smush them together, and then doing so, you actually release energy. That's what nuclear fusion is. Makes sense, nuclear fusion. <coughs> And it's asking, hey, why do we need high, high temperatures for this? You might not know exactly why we might need high temperatures for this, but there are some things you can intuitively um, understand just from knowing this concept of nuclear fusion, as well as eliminate some answer choices here. So I'm going to go over that. I'm going to show you how we can eliminate some answer choices here, and then also intuitively figure out, okay, which of these has to be the correct answer. So it says, A, eliminate the strong nuclear force. What is the strong nuclear force? The strong nuclear force is what holds protons and neutrons together in the nuclear, okay? This is what holds protons and neutrons together. Let's see, a Bohr model of an atom here. This, that's an electron. That's also another electron. The strong nuclear force, that's what holds these guys together. Like I just said, um, you know, the nuclear fusion is when you have two nuclei, you smush them together, and then you fuse them into a bigger nuclei. Well, you want the strong nuclear force to hold these guys together, okay? So you don't want the high temperatures to eliminate the strong nuclear force. You need it. You need it, this, you need it for the, the product in the first place. That makes A incorrect. Also, the um, strong nuclear force, it's, another, it's, it's a force, right? So it's not something that can be easily changed by, by temperatures, if at all, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> uh, but please, feel free to correct me on that if I'm wrong. All right, B says remove electrical charge from reactants. Electrical charge, that's talking about like the positive or negative charges on the protons or electrons. <clears throat> um, that's an intrinsic property of a material, and it cannot be changed um, by just varying the temperatures, at least within the scope of the MCAT. I don't know if there's some maybe theoretical physics out there where you can't do that, but within the scope of the MCAT, and especially for this problem, that is not something you can change with temperature. Decrease the density, oh, decrease the density of the fuel. All right, so what are we doing again? We're smushing two things together, okay? So you have all of these molecules coming around, and you're trying to smash two different molecules, okay, into, into one molecule, right? Well, to do so, you need to kind of compress these guys. So what does that mean? Well, density is the mass over volume. Volume. All right. What are we doing? We're compressing two different things together. We're smushing two things together so that they're closer to each other. What does that mean for volume? We're decreasing the volume that these these things are taking up. Well, if you decrease the volume and the mass is the same, since you still have the same particles, you're just they're just taking up less space. Well, that means density is gonna. Wow, well, density is gonna increase. Okay. So that's C. Oh, sorry. That means C has to be incorrect since you're actually increasing the density of the fuel. Um, we don't know if it's the byproduct of the high temperature, but regardless, you're always going to be increasing the density of the fuel for this nuclear fusion um, reaction to happen. <clears throat> that leaves us with D, probably the correct answer, since we've eliminated A, B, and C. It says, enable reactants to approach within range of the strong nuclear force. So what does that mean? Oh, that's the next discrete there. So when we have molecules, okay, and we're trying to compress them together, there's going to be an electrostatic repulsion, right? Especially if these are some, let's say this is overall plus one charge, this is overall plus one charge, or plus two, plus two. Um, what's happening is you know, these positive charges are gonna repel each other, okay? This electrostatic repulsion makes this one this wanna go this way and this atom wanna go this way. But if you somehow overcome that repulsion and you get these guys within the range of its strong nuclear force, what's gonna happen is, let's say we got close enough like this, this strong nuclear force on this side, well, it's gonna start. It's gonna start acting on these molecules as well. Okay, it's gonna start molecule acting on these molecules, and the strong nuclear force on this side, it's gonna start acting on these molecules as well. So what is that gonna do? That's actually gonna pull them in. So even though you have the electrostatic repulsion, if you somehow get these nuclei close enough together, the respective strong nuclear forces are gonna act on the other nuclei and pull them in. Okay, pull them into each other, and that's what fusion is. That's what you're doing here. You're fusing two different nuclei together. And that's what the high temperatures are needed for. High temperature, when you increase temperature, right, you should know that that's going to increase the velocity okay, of these of these molecules that are flying around in some kind of chamber. 
And as you increase the velocity, that means more kinetic energy, okay? More kinetic energy, which means they're hitting, these molecules are hitting each other stronger. If you're hitting each other stronger, you're increasing the probability that these molecules are gonna get close enough to each other that they can act on each other, where the strong nuclear forces can act on each other and overcome the electrostatic repulsion from the fact that these guys have similar charges. <clears throat> and that's what D is gonna say you're here, enable reactants to approach within range of the strong nuclear force. So that's um, this question here. It is a little bit difficult, especially because I don't think you're expected to know exactly how a nuclear fusion reactor works. However, it is um, it is a it's a very possible question if you know what nuclear fusion is and through a good process of elimination. Let's take a look at question number twenty-seven. This is discrete number twenty-seven, and it says enantiomers can exhibit a difference in which chemical or physical property. All right, enantiomers. What are enantiomers? Remember, they are non-superimposable. Um, mirror images of each other. So if I have a molecule, you know, it, it's, it's, let's say this is my left hand. Let's say this is my right hand. Oops. All right, you know, you'll notice your left hand and right hand are not superimposable on top of each other. So that's what enantiomers, enantiomers are. I'm not going to go too much into it. Um, but you do need to know um, some facts about them, and this is pure discrete. There's really no other way to get around this than just knowing what enantiomers are. A, density enantiomers have the exact same uh, mass as their chemical formulas are exactly the same, and they have the exact same volume as well. So densities have, their density is exactly the same. Enantiomers also have the exact same boiling points. So that's why you can't just boil um, a mixture of enantiomers and hope that one will stay while the other evaporates. They have the exact same boiling point, meaning it can't be a boiling point. Oops. And the correct answer is actually smell. So um, our olfactory receptors, they are very good at uh, differentiating between enantiomers. So while one enantiomer might smell like a banana, another enantiomer might smell like acetone. So uh, it's true, enantiomers, two different enantiomers have different smells. Um, so that makes C the correct answer. And the IR spec, this is something that measures the um, well, bond vibrations between two different atoms, and because enantiomers have identical um, connectivity, IR spec is going to look exactly the same as well. So the correct answer is C, smell, due to the fact that our factor receptors are able to differentiate between enantiomers. 28, and it says, this is discrete. This is a discrete number 28, and it says, blood flows at the speed of 30 centimeters per second along a horizontal tube with a cross-section diameter of 1.6 centimeters. What is the blood flow speed? a part of the same tube that has a diameter of 0 0.8 centimeters. All right, what's happening here? You basically have a tube, and it's going to thin out, okay? It's going to become half as wide. So initially, 1.6 centimeter diameter. Then you enter the 0 0.8 centimeter diameter area. And it tells you that initially it has a 30 centimeter per second flow. All right, so what are you given? You're given diameter. So you're given a measurement of radius, and you're given the blood flow speed. This, what, should, what this should immediately recall for you is the blood flow rate. Okay, the flow rate is how much um, fluid is flowing through a section of a tube at a, uh, per second. And by how much, I mean the volume of the fluid. And what you need to know about these, um, these tubes or these fluid mechanics is that blood, you know, ideally, your blood flow rate, your blood flow rate or the fluid flow rate, flow rate is going to be equivalent across the entire tube um, yeah, just universally. So this is a horizontal tube, so we can definitely assume that's going to be the case here. And um, especially because there's nothing else acting on it. Or no, no other forces that we need to worry about. So again, the flow rate in this tube has to be you know, the exact same from point A to point B. What is flow rate? It's the volume, the volume per second that's flowing, right? Well, how can we calculate the volume? Well, we know what the flow, you know, we know that this is traveling 30 centimeters per second. And we know that the diameter is 1.6 centimeters. So what we can actually do is we multiply the velocity of the of the blood or the velocity of the fluid by the area, the cross-sectional area that this, this fluid is flowing through. So what is that? 1.6 centimeters, that's 0 0.8 centimeters is the radius. Um, area is equal to pi r squared, right? So that's pi times 0 0.8 centimeters squared. All right, and we already have 30 centimeters per second as our um, velocity. So 0 0.8 centimeters squared times pi 
times 30 centimeters per second. That's going to give us our blood flow rate Q. And what did I say? The blood flow rate, the flow rate is going to be the same at this point A and point B where the diameter is 0 0.8. So what does that mean? It means whatever this value is, Q is then also equal to 0 0.8 centimeters. That's the diameter, which means the radius is 0 0.4 centimeters. Area would then be pi times 0 0.4 centimeters squared so that's equal to so whatever this value is it's equal to this value which is going to be pi times 0 0.4 centimeters squared times whatever the velocity is at this point point b so if we do the math here we know that oh, this is the next discrete here we know that 0 0.8 centimeters squared pi times 30 centimeters per second is equal to 0 0.4 centimeters squared pi times velocity at point B. So we can just cross out and do the math here. We know that pi would cancel out on each side. Velocity at point B then would equal 0 0.8 centimeters squared over 0 0.4 centimeters squared um, times 30. What is that? That's basically equal to 0 0.8 or 30 centimeters per second 0 point centimeters over 0 0.4 centimeters squared times 30 centimeters per second that's equal to 4 times 30 centimeters per second and that's equal to 120 centimeters per second that's going to be our velocity at point b and so that leads us to answer oops, Answer D, 120 centimeters per second. All right. All right, let's take a look at the last um, discrete of this batch, and that's which of the following species has an electron configuration equivalent to that of a noble gas? So whenever I get questions where I need to look at the electron configuration of, you know, a blank element, there's a trick I kind of want to show you guys. Um, I don't know if everyone already does this, but it's basically, um, let's say I want to know um, the electron configuration of fluorine, okay? And what I just do is I just fill in electrons like this in a row. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that's the fluorine. And then every time I need to make an ion, I'll add or take away electrons. So let's take a look at... Oops, let's take get rid of all of that. Let's take a look at the electron configurations of these guys. Um, oh, I guess one thing I should also, know, also note is that noble gases, those are going to be the elements in this column right here, the noble gases. All right, calcium 2+. plus. So calcium... That means calcium usually has electrons up to this point right here. 2 plus, however, means that it's lost two electrons. So that means you take away this electron, you take away the electron that should normally be here, and you're going to be left with the final electron being here. So what's, what that means is you basically have electrons from hydrogen, helium, all the way up to argon. There's going to be one electron in each of these slots. So yes, it looks like the last electron here, that's going to be the electron configuration of, for example, argon um, that doesn't have a charge. And that is a noble gas, so it looks like A is going to be the correct answer. But let's make a, let's make sure by going through all of the other um, answer choices. There we go. Yeah. So Cu2+, plus. let's look for, you know, I should probably get rid of these guys. All right. Cu2+, plus. where is Cu? Cu is right here. And so... Now, interestingly, when you have D block elements, when you lose electrons, you actually you don't actually lose electrons from the D block first. You lose them from the corresponding S block. Okay, so Cu two plus doesn't mean you lose electrons from this guy. You actually lose electrons from here. Now, another interesting thing about Cu is that the electron configuration for Cu, um, it isn't just you know one two. It doesn't just go down the line. Um, normally, you know, it would look like something like this, right? The trick I just told you guys. There are some exceptions where Cu is one of them. Um, instead of doing this, what happens is one of these electrons actually gets transported into um, the D block here. So, you know, this guy disappears. And we put that electron instead over here. And then so when we lose... Oh, interesting. Hold on. Give me one second. All right, let's take a look at Cu2+. plus. So if we look at Cu, Cu is all the way over here. And, you know, 
see you would normally like if I if I you know the, with the trick I just told you guys we would just fill in electrons like this. There are some exceptions um, with the D block elements where, um, for example, in CU instead of you know this configuration right here where we just fill in electrons like that, we actually take one of the electrons from the S block and we put them down on the D block. So let me do that real quick. Let's get rid of this guy. And then instead, or actually, we'll we'll uh, we'll get rid of him, this guy. And so what's gonna happen is there we go. That electron stays, and we take the electron that would normally go here and put it over here. Now it doesn't really matter since we're looking at Cu2 plus where we lose two electrons. Um, the first thing to note is that when we do lose electrons, we don't let uh, from the D block elements, we don't lose electrons from the D block first, we actually lose them from the S block first. So we're going to have to take away one electron here, right, and then we'll finally come back here and take away one of these electrons. So what does that mean? The electron configuration doesn't look like one of the noble gas elements since we're looking at something within the D block, making B the incorrect answer. Oxygen and hydrogen, obviously, these electron configurations, you know, oxygen, the electron ends here, it doesn't end in the, D uh, in the noble gas column. And for hydrogen, we only have one uh, electron here, where this is definitely not a noble gas column. So the correct answer leads us to A, since the electrons, if we draw out the electrons, we end up with the last electron being in the noble gas column, and therefore similar to argon's electron configuration.